<laughs> All right, I think most people are back. Those who are coming back. Um, So I want to touch on a few more plugins, um, some of the display capabilities in DD, and then uh, we'll look at the National Center's perspective, we'll look at the localization perspective, um, and then at the end of the day, we've got some Jupyter notebooks um, that we can look over. Um, 
work pretty much the same as what you guys have been using the last two days. Um, quick note about lightning data. Um, we have a restriction on distributing it outside of the um, university community. So we do not ingest lightning data on the public facing cloud server. Um, but for this workshop, for this EDX test server, I've enabled the ESPLN um, data ingest. Um, and the observations are available in the surface menu um, down at the bottom. So ESPLN, uh, there's a few different ways that these are displayed based on um, bidding the time. Uh, and then further down at the bottom is another submenu that has, uh, if these data were available, NLDN, GLD, ENI, and GLM. Um, so I've got an overlay of the uh, channel 2 to this GO16 with the USPLN lightning strikes. Um, and it's out to about two hours. Like in Florida. Yes. When I came back, I still have my shape file that we grabbed from SPC. Okay. I'm trying to clear that, but it doesn't seem clear. Oh, right. So uh, that's a map resource, I believe. So hold right click on the background and show map legends. And it should be down there. And okay. we can unload it by right clicking, hold right clicking to unload that one. Got it. Thanks. All right. You can also just close the tab and open a new one, too. <clears throat> Um, Kevin, is NLBN data still being served out of the Striker server at Albany? Uh, yeah. I think so. Okay. We're getting it. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it is being adjusted. I've got the pattern action enabled, but um, I might have to check on the. Yeah. Yeah, that should be okay. All right. So Unidata distributes both USPLN and NLDN. NLDN we get from the University of Albany, um, but both of those data feeds are restricted. Um, so it's one of the advantages of having your own EX server at your university or your, uh, well, I guess just your university, I don't want to say business, um, would be to ingest it yourself and serve it out to your uh, university network. <clears throat> All right, so up in the models menu, there is a plugin called the Volume Browser um, that we're going to play with. Go ahead and load that. It'll open its own dialog, um, and it is a, another way to load uh, a number of different um, grid parameters and display them in a number of different ways. So similar to the product browser, which has this tree hierarchy that we can select um, grids and drive parameters, and then the bundles that are further down in this menu. We have this up. There we go. So it defaults to a plan view. Um, this is another way that we can build our own bundles and um, see what data are available. So uh, we have a file, an edit, a tools, and then this plan view uh, menu, which uh, lets you toggle between the different display types here. Notice cross-section, time height, bar versus height, sounding, and time series. Those are the uh, six available display capabilities for the volume browser. Plan view is what we've been dealing with so far. It's just a top-down view, two-dimension um, display. So if we, if we leave it in plan view and then come over and select a source, and we should be seeing the available grids in this menu light up with a green square on the left. So it does seem to take some time. Um, we do know that models like GFS Global and the GFS 20 are available. So we can select that. And then a number of different fields are available. And for this example, it doesn't really matter what we choose. I just want to get something up there. So potential temperature, and then we have planes. So pressure levels, theta levels, <clears throat> height levels. Temperature levels, uh, radar tilts, and then miscellaneous, a bunch of other um, levels, potential vorticity. Like max cape, max shear, max omega, things like that. Um, below sea surface, so on and so forth. So we want to do something pretty standard. So or potential temperature, and we see the inventory fill out. We have the time, the latest time available on the left, the 
name of the group and then the inventory with um, plus marks to indicate availability. So you can see, what did this say? What was the time over on the left? 0600. Okay, so it's not the not the latest. I think I turned the LVM off on the server because we're all connected to it. So um, past, say, 10 o'clock this morning, we're not ingesting live data. So I shut off the LVM, but EDEX is still running just because of, I looked at the uh, load average. It was like 30, so I don't know to shut that down. Um, so not all uh, frames, not all forecast hours were ingested for the 0600 um, GFS. You notice, but uh, I'm going to click load and it's just going to load a simple um, contour, just the same as if we had loaded it through the product browser over on the right. <clears throat> um, if you right click on the product, we can see a few more selections, we can change it to an image, uh, the default loading, load it now. Um, as oh, load as both because it both contour and an image show detailed inventory. Show detailed inventory brings up a dialog similar to what we saw earlier that just shows the entire inventory for that particular parameter in that particular group. So, there's our 384 hours of GFS potential temperature. So, we can layer there. We go. So Notice the green squares took a while um, to indicate the model is available. Um, we can load quite a few grids, and every subsequent grid that is loaded is going to have a new unique color. So I believe the first grid that's loaded gets white, the second is green, um, the next is some kind of red. And
So uh, switching from plan view to cross sections uh, in the volume browser, we can see some of the differences in what's presented and how the data are plotted. Um, it's a slightly smaller dialog, a few less options. Uh, we still have volumes, but we also have these uh, point sources available. Um, so plot an example of either global or CONUS GFS. Um, select any of these fields, we can wait till it populates or just select whatever. Let's do relative humidity. And then planes. <clears throat> so planes is uh, specific to the cross-section analyses. And we have some lines of longitude and some lines of latitude that are selectable. Um, and then we have some specified lines. <clears throat> these specified lines, this is a tool within KU. Um, where depending on where you localize the cave client to, you'll have a set of lines around that W forecast uh, WFO office. So back in the um, cave view, under tools, second option down is called baselines. Um, I'm localized to Omaha, so they should show up around OAX. There we go. And they are marked by letter, and that corresponds to the planes that are available within D3D. So these are editable. It's what they call an editable resource. You can click and drag these around, uh, modify them. Here's the thing, and I mentioned this at the beginning of class this morning, we all have the same username on these machines. And so the user localization of these lines means that when I drag one of these around, I put this 100 miles to the east, and then you load the lines, you're going to see my modifications. Um, again, something to be very careful with, and this is not designed for um, classrooms with uh, the same username on every work workshop machine. Um, all right, so anyway, uh, if we select, say, mm, that line A from southwest to northeast, relative humidity, and one of that, we'll see a new cross section window named up in the top of this tab. It's got its own icon. Down at the bottom, and we have our grid loaded. So that volume browser window is still open, and we can add multiple fields to it. There we go, two point. We can add drive parameters, just add a bunch of stuff, and we can select some of these and say change to images just to make things a little different. Load as both, and select load, and it will redraw load up all of those fields in the background, including the images. Drop to the bottom. So, <clears throat> this is going to be an ugly display. Uh, yeah, you get a sense of <clears throat> what it's capable of. This is a uh, feature that existed in GARP that did not exist in GEMPEC. Um, GEMPEC had a GD cross, an SM uh, cross and a couple other programs that you could run through the command line to produce cross sections, but it did not have a GUI, nmap2 and uh, the other end did not have a GUI function for cross sections. Um, and so 
Neiman Theta has always had this small contingent of Genbrack users who still ran GARP. Um, that was one of the big reasons. <coughs> um, these cross-section displays are zoomable and panable. Um, and similar to the plan view, we can move these uh, parameters up and down. We can load the contours as images and images as contours so on and so forth. And we have a little ins insert up at the top right that shows the location of that plane. <clears throat> now the text is pretty small um, and if I zoom in it doesn't really change anything. It just stays in the same font size for the, the screen. But that is Kansas, the southwest corner. And over here would be I can't read that. I don't know. Somewhere up in uh, Iowa. All right. Let's close that. We still have our um, cross section dialog window open. And we can, with, under the edit menu, we can clear all, we can clear sources, fields, or planes. So depending on the type of a volume browsing window, um, we can clear all or just some of the new fields. So we can clear planes, and clear fields, and then clear sources. Let's get back to the square one here. We also can modify the um, vertical coordinate, the vertical scale, for the cross-section, linear or Rhythmic or uh, kilometers or feet above ground level. So pretty customizable. And um, this kind of ties into the localization perspective, which we should start looking at soon, where somewhere in the localization perspective is a configuration file that defines all of these available levels, and we can modify that, add to it, or remove it from it. <laughs> So uh, take a look at the rest of these options. We can switch to time height. And again, sources, fields, and plans, slightly different uh, availability. Just takes a temperature, and planes is going to be D2D points. So no longer lines but dealing with points. So back in our cave window, where we have the interactive baselines loaded. Up in tools, but halfway down is the points tools. Go ahead and load that, and you should see a number of points surrounding your localization office. And they will be marked with a letter as well. So these are the points that are available for a time height plot and say point E up in Iowa. Go, go its temperature, load that, and have its own window. And the insert top right showing the location. And then again, we can load as image and contours. We can interrogate it with sampling. So all of the um, interactive sort of capabilities of the plan view are also available, time height, cross section, and the rest. So again, this is very difficult to read, but we've got, um, let's see, zero hour on the right, Wednesday, to 33 hours out, 15Z Thursday on the left. So time increasing to the left. <clears throat> and once again, the vertical scale can be modified. Um, we can change this from the default uh, logarithmic scale to, say, Actually, that's not going to give me either. Oh, I hit load again, and it loaded a new tab. So now we've got two of them open. Um, one with a log vertical scale, and the other with a linear height vertical scale. So here's our two examples.
Okay, so bar versus height. Similar to time height, where we can get our TGD points, select the same, one of these. And it's a very simple um, vertical profile. This is essentially like drawing a sounding, so using the um, gridded model data. Um, I don't think, yeah, since this is a line element, there is no imagery or contouring here. It's just we can specify the color and say it's green and the width. So again, all of the modifications that we can make, the style, dotted, so on and so forth. Magnification, I don't think that's going to do much. Oh, there we go. So magnification finally made this readable. Actually, this might be a good time to change the background color. There we go. It's a little better. <clears throat> yeah, something like that. Clear all. Time series. Um, there's going to be a few new sources here. Um, we've got our volume sources, which are our uh, models. We have a um, submenu called surface grids, and then points. Um, we're available points available for um, location mm -hmm. like the Rose buffer, um, and GFS buffer, uh, METAR stations, AOB, um, and a few others. Say like METAR. One of these, the plane, and that didn't load anything. So, there we go. Metar, level pressure, surface, load that, and I have screwed the background. No, that didn't load, did it? Probably not choose new tar here. So clear sources and then choose something like say GFS twenty again. Oops. Go. Time series. There we go. Simple time series. Turning on sampling, we can get a little um, finer details showing up actual time on the x axis. Uh, sounding, which I skipped over, uh, it's the last one to cover. Um, this is going to employ the NSHARP plugin. And we can either select a model or a point, Rayob, profiler, buffer. I'm going to leave it with model. Fields, sounding points, again, the D2D points. So stick with that and confirm that there are data available. Load that. It takes a second, but yeah. It opens an NSHARP editor, same as selecting um, the NSHARP plugins available on the toolbar or the menus, but this is using the GFS 20. So here's our model sounding. Okay, so I mentioned the localization perspective a few times, and we haven't looked at it yet, but this is a good time to go in and start playing with it. Um, I'm going to switch this back to cross-sections. 
and again show this um, vertical coordinate menu for gives us options for logarithmic or linear um, vertical scales. So we're going to go find this in the localization perspective. How we reach that is one of two ways. We can go into the cave perspective menu and select localization. Um, note that the last option says other. So there's five available through this menu, plus there's other. This is one of the most like long-standing annoyances with a whips that nobody has been able to solve yet, but there is a hidden perspective that does not show up in the small little menu, and it's the National Center's perspective, and it shows up when you select up. Here it is, NCP. Nobody knows why, but the NSF developers did something at some point years ago where it does not show up in that little menu. So <laughs> we're going to go into the NCP later, but for now, open up the localization perspective. And I said there's two ways to get there. The other is you should see this. Uh, open perspective uh, button over on the right. It could be on the left. If you right click it, I believe you can position it. Uh, maybe not. Anyway, so you can select that and it should open this other and we can select a localization perspective. All right. <clears throat> this is essentially a text editor. Um, what it's going to uh, do is expose a lot of the configuration and customization for Cave. All of the menu items, all the bundles, the color maps, pretty much everything involved with Cave is editable and configurable through this interface. Um, you'll see the tree over on the left. Uh, I would disregard the first uh, item called Cave. It's just plug-in um, configuration files. We're not going to be messing with that. But D2D um, has most of what we'll be editing here. So we have three volume browser um, submenus available. You know, the height scales, the menus, and the sources. And this height scales, what you'll notice is when you click down into this tree and you double click the actual height scales.xml, it doesn't open the file yet. It opens the localizations that are available. And so without any user or workstation localization, without any customization, everything is base. And you double click on this to actually open the XML file in the editor. And it should open by default to this XML view, which is not helpful and ugly. And so down at the bottom, I would switch over to the source tab, and we can see the actual file rather than the, the XML design of the file. So here are the vertical scales, vertical. Coordinates and what's available in that menu within the cross section volume browser. And this is editable, but it's not editable just yet. So if we do try to click and delete or add line breaks, it's not going to take because, again, this is the default configuration and it protects itself from us overriding default. So back over on base, if we right click, you don't have to hold right click, just one right click. You'll notice this copy and copy two, and the copy two is going to give you a submenu that shows you the different localization levels. So region, site, desk, workstation, user, you copy it to a new file. <clears throat> so we do not have permission to copy it to region. We don't use region localization. We can't copy it to site or desk, but we can do either workstation or user. And again, since we all have the same username in this classroom, let's not use user localization. Let's use the workstation localization. Because each of us has a different name for the machines that we're connecting from. So there will be no conflict and overriding of each other's files as long as we select the workstation localization. But just for an example, let me copy this to a user localization, right? And it updated. And so if, if you guys have the same file open, you can right click on the name of the XML and hit refresh, and you should all see that new user localization that I created, right? No? Not yet. Not yet. Maybe it takes a second to sync. Huh? You can also try to toggle and reopen like so. Anybody get that to show up? No, okay. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to delete that then, and we won't worry about it. 
All right, so disregard that. Um, go ahead and copy it to workstation localization, whatever your machine is, and double click that new localization level for the file workstation. And notice this file is editable. So we can make changes to this. And this is just an example. We're not going to do anything very important with this. We don't need to add or remove any scales, but just for example, I can just remove, say, everything but three. Save it. And then it may take a restart of cave in order for that to show up, but we'll see if we can just restart the dialog window for cross sections. <laughs> Looks like I screwed something up. Oh, I see. Okay. I don't see. Yeah, it looks like that didn't work. Uh -huh. Well, we can try a few other examples here. So under browser menus, we have planes uh, and volume up, oh, sorry, under volume browser sources, we have a submenu VB sources and a number of files. So volume, surface grid, point, and GFE sources. Um, surface grid and volume we want to look at here. So we copy this one to workstation again and double click to open. You can see it's a list of model names that are available within the volume browser. Um, switch back to DPD really quick. And default is plan view. And so we have the list of models available for the volume menu. And list of models available for the surface menu. So you notice a lot of these don't exist. Like we don't have the NAM4, um, we don't have the MS server, we don't have like great, uh, great lakes uh, mm -hmm. surface model. Um, And if we went ahead and edited these out, take out, say, the M4, and the X, and the Ensemble, and the ACWF, so on and so forth, save those, should be able to, to see. Browser. Yep. I think it's going to take a restart. I think that is kind of finicky with some of these. So I don't want to go to the trouble of um, dealing with that restarting just to show. Um, all right, so what else is available that is customizable? Um, color maps. Pretty much anything that is available in the DQD perspective. I'll quickly load up a say IR color map, uh, IR image. And opening up the change color map, if you remember the, this directory here um, with the different data types, different data sources, and whatnot. At the bottom, we'll see a user submenu, right? And any modifications to existing color maps, like we were fiddling with it earlier this morning, are going to be dumped down into the submenu. So when we have uh, user accounts, Different user accounts uh, connect to the same edX server. We should see a list of different people. And if we connect it to the edX cloud machine, this list gets pretty long um, in the hundreds. So essentially, when we modify a color map within D2D um, by selecting, say, edit colors, or make modifications like so, interpolate, and save. That just creates a user localization of SAP IR zero IR default. 
So we can go back in. We should be able to find this one, sat IR zero IR default. There we go. There's the user localization. Somebody has edited it, probably you. Double clicking on a color map is going to bring up the color map editor. Direct editor, but we can also again select source at the bottom and see the actual CMAP text file or XML file. Yeah, with the uh, red, green, blue, and alpha transparency values specified color map. Map scales. So back in D2D, I'll switch back really quick. This top left menu, uh, <clears throat> global and regional and WFO map scales. This is also editable. Um, and in WFO, yeah, okay. So there is a file called scalesinfo.xml. Um, down towards the bottom, that is the main file for organizing um, the existing uh, map scales. And so what we have available in this file directly ties into what's available in that scales menu. And the first four have a uh, slightly different definition than the rest of them because they are specified as the defaults for the five pane layout. When we enable five panes and we've got the four windows on the left and the one on the right, um, this file here is determining which map scales are used for which of those windows. But anything past that, anything that does not have a definition of a part ID is just a available map scale within that submenu. So like our goes east full disk, our regional Africa, and our regional Alaska, if we were to create a new projection, we could then add it to this file with a user localization, we would copy the base to user or workstation. And then restart cave, and we would see the new map files available. Menus and menu bundles. They are grouped by product type. Um, so if we select, say, radar, this does get a little bit hairy because we have to sort of dig down and find out how the menu files are organized. Uh, but there's generally an index.xml file in any subdirectory. So I'm in menus, radar, index, uh, configured OX. Let's see. I think I want that Base radar menu. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so again, like I said, this gets kind of hairy because we're looking at uh, one file specifies another, specifies another. So it's radar index, which I'm not exactly sure um, what specifies that, but you can see it's a menu entry. Um, it specifies a file named base radar menu. We open up base radar menu. Um, again, this is pretty ugly to look at, but we see NextRad display. Um, we see the submenus for NextRad stations, uh, TWR stations, and then the Unidata composites, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is determining the structure of this radar menu. We can add to it and remove it, customize it whatever we want. Again, we're going to do this at a localization, uh, workstation localization level. So for example, uh, base radar menu, uh, copy this to workstation, double click to open, and then just <clears throat> grab and remove like, almost everything from there. Just make some big, terrible edit. And this is going to require a restart, which I'll do really quickly, and you guys don't have to if you don't want. There is a restart button within the localization preferences. I 
over here. And the radar menu, I took out all of the um, level three um, cave rather composites. So I just left in that next rather photo sub menus. And what else did I do? Let's see if that volume browser update actually worked. No, I did something wrong modifying those um, height scales for volume browser that I shouldn't have. Oh, anyway. <clears throat> All right, so the menu subfolder will allow you to add and remove entries that uh, appear in the menus. The menu bundles uh, folder is going to have all of the XML files that are referenced by the menus. So again, bear with me. This is kind of ugly and hairy, but let's go into, say, radar. And we're looking at base radar menu. And okay, let's look at this one bundle here. This is the unit data composite DHR. This is tough to see, and I can't really erase the font. I should unhighlight this, make it stick out a little bit more. So it says contribute to this menu. This is a bundle item. Here's the bundle file. It's called bundle slash default radar composite.xml. You can find this file back up in the <coughs> menu bundles. Um, file. But notice the substitutions here. We can send parameters. We can say the element is DHR, the color map is such, and interpolate is true or false. So back up under bundles, uh, default radar composite. Composite, there we go. Double click on base. And again, this is ugly, this is XML, but give you a sense of how this works. We've got our element that we passed in this variable. Um, and we have our interpolation boolean and our color map name specified in the menu file. So, in order to you know really dig down and modify the bundles in this text editor, you do have to sort of track what file is referencing what, um, and it is not the most user friendly interface. Um, We've got plot models that are um, SVG files. So, <clears throat> METARs, let's see. Look at some of these. It's essentially like XML. Uh, I probably shouldn't go into this. This is not something you're really going to be modifying as a user too much. Um, Got our saved bundles that uh, we've all been writing uh, in its own folder. Again, we've all got the same username, so we can overwrite each other. Uh, we have style rules for uh, imagery and grids. Uh, so under this D2D style rules directory, you can see um, there's a standard format of the files. It's the data type uh, and then imagery style rules. That, you know, so Kaida satellite imagery style rules grid imagery style rules, satellite, radar imagery style rules. We've got satellite imagery style rules. <coughs> and we see some entries. These are tough to read, but um, we can specify the style rule and the parameter level matches. So we do the strings for, uh, that, that match the parameter levels. In this case, uh, different IR channels. And then you can have a uh, display units, display centigrade, uh, scale, the actual color map being used, the color map labeling. So back in D2D. Yes. Is there something that actually tells what is available to use within the styles? So what yeah. sort of uh, tags you can use and what sort of, you know, say for example, looking at this satellite imagery one, you're looking at the label, display value, pixel value, things of that sort, display units. 
I, I don't think so. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think I think we have to reference the actual Java classes um, that um, maintain these. So there is a like style rules .java that will have. Um, I don't think there's an easy way. So sorry. So like let's say we load up a IR eleven micron IR. Oops, I messed up that. I changed that color map. So let's try something else. There we go. No, let's try something else. DHR. Okay. So DHR. Um, and notice the labels up at the color map. It's from minus 32 to roughly 94 and a half, 95 um, for level three reflectivity. Um, and back under satellite imagery style rules, it, you'd think it would be radar, but I mentioned earlier today that these composites are actually sort of spoofing uh, satellite Gini images. So search DHR. Here's the entry for DHR and N0Q, display values in DBZ, default color map, high res reflectivity, and then data mapping um, with pixel value and labels. So um, the actual labels on that DHR image are determined by the display value here. Um, and we have pixel values with min and max for um, the Gini image that was created. And then it scales accordingly based on those definitions. So you can see um, minus 20. Yeah. You notice we have a display value, a pixel value, and a label. And so if the label is specified as blank, it will not be displayed with anything uh, without a label definition within its entry. We'll take the display value and uh, we'll overlay that on the color map. So here's our color map up at the top left. <laughs> Arc from minus 20 to 70. So we don't have one at 80 or 90 or minus 32 and a half because we've forced it with this label equals blank. It's just a way to pretty up and have like full control over display of our images. OK, so I've mentioned derived parameters a few times. And it's the last section um, to cover within this D2D menu. Let's go back up and close these out. Derived parameters uh, is essentially like Gempack functionality, where we can take the, the grid parameters that exist in a um, model. So, all right, so when you ingest a group two grid file into edX, it will decode every single parameter in the file and save it to HDF5. And all of those grid fields are available through the product browser over on the right. But if we add derived parameter definitions, both as Python modules and as XML definitions of those Python modules, then we can make available all the drive parameters within this product browser hierarchy and we can load them with our bundles. So like when we're loading surface temps and winds, up here, models, GFS 20, surface temperature and wind, we can go in and look at that actual bundle file and see what's being referenced. And in that will be the uh, definition for wind, which does not exist as its own grid in the file. It's a direct parameter using the UNV component. Let me go find that. Many bundles. Go find this. Okay, so bundles grid surface temp win.xml is the name of the file. Navigate back up. 
Good. Service temp win. There we go. All right. And again, this is pretty ugly, but just want to show. Here it is. Okay. So it's kind of this block of XML here that is saying the constraint value when uh, model name is passed in from another XML file, and we have uh, uh, fixed height above ground level. Um, sure, that's the right one. This one. So the way that cave works is if the parameter that's defined exists, such as down here, temperature, T, if that exists just as its own uh, grid in the file, it will retrieve it and display it. If it does not exist, it will check that a derived parameter function exists. And that's the case with wind. We just want a single um, field called wind that we can call. So let me go into drive parameters. We have uh, two directories that we're going to look at are definitions and functions. So first in definitions, there's a lot of files in here. So they're alphabetized, thankfully, but down at the bottom, there should be a win.xml. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, win.xml, finally. And Opening this up, we see a few different uh, method definitions. So um, there is a, what we want to pay attention to is the name. So if it says method name equals vector, that means that there is a file called vector.py, Python module, that will create a vector field from the two input fields here. So this is taking U and B components in meters per second, and it's telling Cave to pass those two fields from the grid into the vector.python module, and then use that. Um, for display. Um, there's a lot of like simple uh, mathematical operators like average, um, multiplication, addition, and whatnot. So it's this file that we want to go see exists in the functions directory, which is further down, because we're in the parameter, or the, sorry, the definitions directory looking at win.xml, and we want to go find vector.py. So further down. We have functions, and we get alphabetized. So down at the bottom, we look for vector.py, open that up, and here is how oh, that's difficult to read, isn't it? So here's our Python module for drive parameters. And it takes uh, input of U and B in a magnitude of direction with a default to none. Um, got a short little comment there about. Um, Magnitude direction and a tuple of, it returns the tuple of UV. And then the mathematics, in order to create the uh, single vector wind field from the UV components. So take a look in this directory. You know, I'm in drive parameters functions, and we have most basics such as like addition, um, passing in just two or more things to add up. We have um, a lot of meteorological fields. We have velocity, we have cape, convective inhibition, um, theta E. So pretty much uh, any usable um, dynamic or thermodynamic field has been added to AWIPS. And the nice thing about this is it's been vetted for forecasting. It's used operationally, so it's a good base uh, of Python modules to, to use in other packages. And actually, um, Ryan has said, I think you want to look at some of these and integrate these into MetPy since they've already been tested and vetted. Um, this, is, this is really perfect for this idea of getting gem pack like derived parameters available in MetPy. You can just use what AWIPS has available. <clears throat> well, vorticity calculations. Essentially, all of these modules, we can just rip these out of the system and use them independently. We just have NumPy imports, and then we just call these from whatever package we have. Um, 
this is the part of Cave that does not work completely in Mac right now, that is being worked on for the next release. Um, there is a, a dependency on Python on the client. And for Linux, it's very easy because we just bundle it. It gets installed as an RPM, and the dependency is resolved. But for Mac, it's a lot more difficult than that. Um, so similar to all the XML files, we can modify these. I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think we need to go in and modify the vorticity calculations just for me as a user or for the site, but it is possible. Um, however, if we navigate back up to the functions directory and right click, we can import a file. We can add our own derived parameters straight into the localization perspective. And then we can call those functions from Cave. We can specify them in bundles, and we can get our own parameters displayed in Cave. So it's kind of similar to the hold right click, or not, sorry, hold, not hold right click, but right click on base and copy to new file. So we can take, say, conducted inhibition, copy that to a new file, and just call that you know, newarm.py. And it will be added alphabetized, so it's a little further down. But it will not have a base localization. It will only be a user localization. And from this, we can copy to Workstation if we want it and have these available to modify. Although uh, convective inhibition looks like it just imports from Kate, so that's not a good one to use. Uh, let's see if we can delete that. Yeah, so like vorticity. Vorticity.py. Um, so yeah, rather than copying, we can just say import file, and it'll open up the system file manager. And if we have Python scripts there, we can just import them um, ourselves. So I know this is not a very user-friendly interface. Uh, I didn't design it, and I'm not a really big fan of it, but it's what we have. Um, thankfully, it's alphabetized. There was a moment in time where the product tree back in D2D was not alphabetized at all. They were just randomly displayed, which made it almost impossible to use. So yes, this is pretty cumbersome. Um, but I want you guys to be aware of it, not so much as making modifications and adding your own direct parameters, but for reference. So if you are dealing with Python, if you're dealing with Cython and MetPy and all these other packages, and say there isn't a derived parameter available in those packages, we can go into the localization perspective and try to find if it exists in AWS. Just copy it over um, into your scripts or whatever package you're using. How do you guys feel about that? Do you guys like this interface? No. Well, I mean, I, I love seeing this library of Python functions. Yeah. That's going to be a nice repository. I mean, it's just, it's just so, it's just so much stuff. It's especially difficult to try to track down where some um, data plugin menu and bundle files actually are. So like, if I wanted to modify the colors for the ASCAT wins, I mean, on the development machine, I can go in and grab for that string and find out where it is pretty easily. But where the heck do I find that? This, it's not a very user-friendly system. Um, it would most likely be somewhere over in menus under satellite. Yeah, I, I don't think I want to go try to find this. Some of them are pretty easy, like under satellite, we've got uh, Himawari, and it goes our um, subdirectory that contain all of the menu files for those products. So again, this is, we have to make a guess that the top level is going to be something called index. So it probably goes our dash index. 
there was also those are menu that XML that looks like a file. So yeah, it does take some investigating and seeing which files are referencing other files. So there we go. So in this case, gozar-index is just referencing a single file, gozar menu. So why does that even exist? Why not just reference gozar menu? Anyway. <clears throat> Michael, is that where the customizations for the different localization stations are? Like, I noticed when I localized mine to Milwaukee, it had like a boulder or a uh, Colorado radar along the top menu. Oh, interesting. Okay. <clears throat> I think it's defaulting to FTG then for anything other than Omaha. But if I wanted to change that and put Milwaukee or the Milwaukee terminal Doppler or something along the top, is this sort of where I would go digging around? I believe so, yeah. Um, let's see. Actually, I'm not sure. I don't think I can answer that. I think it may be a Java class that um, I think this happens on the server and the server sends back which radar menu uh, is available to the client. You know, I'll, I'll make that as an issue. Yeah. All right, so there's a lot of these directories which I'm not going to touch on. Uh, you'll notice Hydro and MPE and NCEP. Um, NCEP will look in uh, shortly here. We should probably take a break um, pretty soon. Hydro and MPE are two perspectives in AWIPS that uh, I don't teach in the workshop and not a lot of our users use, but they're still made available. Hydro and MPE. Um, MPE is the multi sensor precipitation estimator, uh, and Hydro is uh, a perspective for managing the Hydro apps. Um, and again, we don't teach it, and a lot of it is based on original AWIPS 1, and uh, GFE and Hydro especially require components in AWIPS 1 that we don't have in AWIPS 2. Um, we leave it in there because students like to play with it and get some experience with it, um, but I am by no means an expert with the uh, graphical forecast editor in PE or Hydro. Um, National Center's perspective, uh, we'll look at that uh, when we come back from break. It is developed by NSEP and used at the National Center, Storm Prediction, um, Hurricane Center, OPC, SWIPC, so on and so forth. And we'll play around with that uh, when we're back. Take 10, 15 minute break. Kevin, I think what I need to do is pull all the drive parameter files out, put them in their own repo, and publish it like that. Yeah, maybe you can just dump it in the text and make some docs out of it. Yeah. And just search online. Yeah.
So what's the specs of your EDEX server that you do running these days? Is it 80 gigs? 100 gigs. Yeah. Um, and the cloud instance is 48 cores, which is the largest instance that Jetstream mm -hmm. allows. Just a massive amount of data. So I have like 16 group decoders running in parallel and 8 radar, which is pretty cool. Oh, yeah, this is. Uh, it's a little behind everything going. So are you running LDM again? Mm -hmm. You did turn it in. Yeah. Yeah, load yeah, numbers. Mm -hmm. And once you, once you show me or point me out to the 13.1. So check this out. Um, um, Close that AWIPS file. Mm -hmm. Just change AWIPS2 to AWIPS2 dev. Oh, yeah. it's, there's always a dev version out there. So. Okay. At the start of a merge, it's not very stable, but it's pretty good. Right and CentOS so 6 is fine. Mm -hmm. right. I should have a CentOS 7 version as well. Kind of a Jetstream jet dev version. It won't be until next summer. Right? And at some point, um, this is probably something to bring in front of the users committee, but at some point we've got to abandon CentOS 6 and just yeah. support 7. Yeah. Or yeah, just I, make like legacy like 17.1 yeah. or whatever, just keep it out there. Yeah, yeah to see where people who are interested in running ABUPS are. <clears throat> Uh, Bob Stoops is going to retire. Bob Stoops is going to retire. He announced when he will retire? Like one more season? No, like the now? word on Espen right now is like. He's done? Yeah. Wow. They're, they're, they have written the article like talking about his past accomplishments. Maybe they'll go coach in the NFL. <laughs> 19 years. Longest, I have the longest tenure head coach. Wow. He's only 57. I don't think he's got a shot at a title again, do you? It's like all SEC. And... No, he goes out with a win over Auburn. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's just interesting. Maybe mm -hmm. he's like, I've made enough money. I can go, you know, just yep. enjoy life at this point. I don't blame him. It's just a. I was not expecting that to see that come across the ESPN screen. Yeah. What the? Wow. Uh, 
Oh, hello. That's, nice. That's a hook echo almost. That's in the mountains. Can't move. Mm. Side of Colorado Springs. Why? Look at this. Colorado Springs, Lake George. Where's that? Oh. Oh, you're, well, that's a four bit. Dear God, can you do? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> <let's see. laughs> Eight bits, I guess. That's the 255 values, yeah. Oh, right there. Yeah. 99. Eh. Border's about to get hit. Look at that. Oh, of course. Let's see. You have the multi panel display somewhere. Yeah, it was being kind of finicky. It wouldn't load the interactivity. Okay, there we go. Uh, I think that's faking out. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the mountains. <laughs> Great felicity. Yeah. Ways the data kind of calibrate that data properly again. What FTG? Yeah. What's up with it? Look at the ZDRs for those reflectivities. Mm -hmm. 
might not huh. be I might not be ingesting it. I looked at stuff that was pretty heavy rain and ZDR was like maybe 0.3. <laughs> I was like, no, that I'm not even close. That didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, half an inch or something. What's that gold hill? Wow. Sucks for them. There's the wind farms in Arizona. Somebody was noticing like the only one that was seemingly accurate was the old preset products rather than the new ones. So I think ZDR just completely foo barred on the radar. Yeah, when John and I were driving to go to Millersville, you know, having rain along 470, and it's like, okay, yeah, this is you know, DDR. What? There's no way. Uh, it's not hailing. It's not white rain. These are big drops that have a significant differential. And it just didn't. It's like just turned the LDM back on, so I've only got a few frames of this. Yeah. Why was it off? Just. These were all downloading Gozar stuff, and that load average was 30. So one of the maps that are available is uh, topography. Um, and it's its own HDF5 file that uh, just sits statically on the server, but we can reference it, uh, call it through the topography option in the maps. Um, I'm just showing a couple of projections here, um, including full disk, which looks kind of cool with it. Um, and then, you know, we've got things like volcano locations that we can overlay. Um, set like time zones up. There's a lot of these map options. Meet our station locations, fix buoy. Warning areas. Warning areas is going to show the outline of the area of responsibility for each WFO. Things like that. So you get some pretty neat rendering with a, a lot of the different Geo data sources that are available. I've got like uh, maximum density for the uh, volcano locations. It's kind of clever. But... All right, so we can switch to the uh, National Center's perspective, the NCP, through the perspective other menu. Double click NCP. Um, you may or may not see a little dialogue that pops up with a couple of warning messages, just click it and dismiss it, it's okay. Um, default view is a Mercator world projection zoomed into North America. Um, and kind of a similar interface to D2D where we've got um, a couple of like standard menus up top and then a um, <coughs> loop controls. Um, and step through is over on the right, and a couple of tools that are available in the toolbar, PGN, NC Text, and then Chart. What we don't see are the product menus up top, so it's a little bit different here. We also don't have the um, map scales menu uh, in the toolbar. Instead, it's uh, its own menu here in the uh, area dropdown. Um, so a note about the National Center's perspective. Um, what NCEP started doing years ago was uh, rather than extend existing Raytheon plugins, um, they copied them over and modified them uh, so that they could fit their own version of data handling. So everything's been kind of abstracted. Um, and it's, I don't think it's a very good decision um, for the developers to have made. And uh, the talk now at NCEP is that they're considering redoing it all. So. It's possible that in the future we'll see a lot of the NCEP specific plugins migrated over to D2D 
And N Sharp is one of those examples that's already been migrated. And product generation, PGen, is another that's been migrated. Um, so how we load data in the National Center's perspective is slightly different. Rather than selecting uh, bundles from menus, we have a NMAP2 sort of interface. So anybody here familiar with NMAP2 and the other N programs in Gempack? OK. So this probably looks familiar to you. They tried to keep the interface uh, as similar to the old NMAP2 and um, NProgs as possible. Um, rather than loading through menus, we add uh, products through this interface here. It's called Resource Manager. <coughs> and notice the tabs up top. It's defaulting to create a bundle. Um, so this idea of we add multiple data layers and we can save bundles uh, through this interface rather than saving them through the um, uh, menu dialog like we were doing with D2D. So we select Add. We get another pop-up that is going to show us our data types that are available. So we have categories on the left, satellite, radar, grid, surface, up rare, and so on. And then resource type for that category, and then a resource group for the type, and the attributes for the group. So at the top, we have the FNEXREG composites. And again, I said that these are radar products, but they're actually handled by the satellite plugins, so they are under the satellite category. Um, in this case, the resource type. F, F, resource type, FNEXRAD, the resource group, Nexer Comp, and then the resource attributes. It's going to show the latest available um, times for these data files. Select any of those. It's going to show the latest data down at the bottom, the selected resource name, and we can either double click on the entry over here, double click the DHR, or at the bottom, add resource. And that will add it to our data stack. And it's not rendered yet. We're just creating a bundle here within this window. Um, notice the two resources up top called overlays. Those are by default added to every single bundle. Um, the locator and the base map, the geopolitical boundaries. Now, the locator is a uh, sort of in-map tool that, um, modify this, locator. It is going to, by default, show us the lat lawn of the cursor position. So it's down here at the bottom left, and when we move the cursor around, you can see that lat lawn get updated, right? But we can change that to any of these available fields. So we can change it to, like, next red ID. It'll show the closest uh, digital ID. ID. Uh, state name, state abbreviation, volcano, for whatever reason. Um, any of these map <coughs> resources are available. So you say, like, cities. And apply, and there we go. So we don't have cities plotted, but wherever the mouse is, it's going to show the, the um, closest city. And so if we wanted to add an overlay of cities just to make this look a little better, we can add overlays. Let's go. Not that work. There we go. All right. So there we go. So there's cities, right? If we go back into bundle, up at the top, load that window again, and we'll see that the city's overlay that we added through this overlay map, or, sorry, through this overlay menu, we'll see that added to the default display bundle. And then we've got our other two. Notice this E here. That means that that's been edited because I did select the locator and I changed it to cities from that lawn. So that shows that there's been a user modification for that resource in the stack. And we select any of these, and we notice some buttons being highlighted. We edit, remove, um, turn off, and then up and down for moving these things up in the stack. It behaves sort of the same way as D2D, where uh, you want your images at the bottom and sort of point data and contours further up. But we can edit, and it's the same dialog that you can open with a right click on the resource stack back in the, back in the view. Do the same thing with cities. We can do an edit. And we get this sort of special um, editing dialog for our marker type for the cities. It's a plus. Uh, text size, marker size, display threshold for symbols, um, display threshold for labels. So that's when we're zooming in, the city names and markers weren't showing up until we were in a certain uh, zoom level. And that's adjusted here. The color, so let's do this like max out. So 
So I made those modifications, those arbitrary modifications really to the overlay schemes, and now it says that it's been edited. It didn't update in the in the background of the map, because we still have this uh, bundle generation dialog open. So we have two options here, load and load and close. Load and close obviously will load whatever's in the stack and close this dialog, whereas the load button will just simply update the background view, and yet that window does not disappear, so it's still there. So oh, from here, we can start adding some resources. We can say satellite images, DHR, double click. Oops, hey. Ooh, that's weird. Uh, oh, I see. DEL, there we go. So it had loaded second tab and it was kind of loading it to the first, I think, not updating the dialogue. So anyway, um, loaded a satellite um, resource to the stack. Since it's the only data type that's been loaded so far, the rest of these are overlays or map resources. It now becomes the dominant resource. So similar to uh, in D2D, managing it with that whole right-click menu to say what resource is the dominant for time matching, um, this is a migration of a map to code to handle um, the selected times. You can skip a number of frames. You can uh, increase like so just by dragging. Include G uh, dialogues. You can just drag this and expand out. Uh, this is seven days, so I just want to look at the last 24 hours or so. We can skip every other frame, every two, every three, and the um, yeah, the timeline will update accordingly. Right. So we can select load, and it will keep that dialog up. Something went bad. Yeah, I'm getting that too. Oh. All right. Well, I don't think it's so important just to get the data loaded as it is to understand how things are managed here. So, what I want to do is show a couple of these. Say, like a Ginny goes 13 image. We can select it. Yep, he's Conus IR. Double click that. Oh. Folks, this isn't working. That works. That works, okay. All right, so there's some work that still needs to be done on this. I just wanted to get two products uh, up here in the stack so that we can show that both of them are going to display in the dominant resource. Um, by default, it'll be the first that's loaded, but we can switch it over to any of the other data sources to say that these are our dominant resources. Um, all right, so there she goes. That loaded. Something about the uh, FNX Red Guinea images are not loading. Um, all right. <laughs> So from this dialog, we can save a bundle um, in a couple of different ways. Um, save button down here is going to bring up a, another dialog that says, here's your group and here's your name. So I called SPFs and RDDs and these need to be changed because really it's groups and bundles. Um, essentially, this is the RBD name is going to be called, let's see, name this. R, and I want to put that into okay. Nope. No spaces. Save that. Says it's saved, and we should see that over here. Yeah. Okay. So I gave it a name. It, it told me that I couldn't have spaces in the name. It goes IR and it's in the SPF, which is a group satellite. 
save it, confirm that it was saved, and then up at the top over at load bundle, switching tabs over to the left, we can see that that goes IR bundle is now uh, is showing up in the bundle manager. So it is going to show the resources that we added to the bundle. Um, it goes through teams, makes our call, it's going to show our dominant resources in the timeline. Um, and down at the bottom, we have a load and a load and close again um, for loading. So this is actually a multi-select, so we can say select all. There's a button down here in the center for select all. Um, and we can load all. Um, I don't know if those default, I think these are example bundle files came with the program. I don't know if those will actually load would be useful. Um, but I believe they should load out one each in their own tab. Yeah, there we go. So there's the one that we created. I still have my preview tab open. This is sort of the product generation or bundle generation preview tab. Once it's been saved and named, it will open as its own tab with its name and it'll be numbered um, in order. So, like I said, I don't think these are going to show much. These sort of default examples, they're just showing the base maps. So, yeah. There's also this tab called Manage Bundles which is going to allow us to modify um, and delete bundles from groups and bundles themselves. So we can say modify a group, create group, or delete group. Uh, modify group is going to show the existing. I saved a bundle into satellite. And we can go in and say, okay. Interesting, yeah. Huh, oh, there seems to be a permission issue, so yeah. This isn't working very well. All right, the last tab, let's just skip over that, just ignore it, pretend it never happened. Um, the last tab is for managing data. Um, you'll notice that it looks very similar to the adding data. If we go back to that second tab, create bundle and select add, this is the interface for um, adding resources to the bundle creator. So back in manage data, we have all of these data sources and attribute files and groups available for editing. And so if we say take a grid of let's see, oh, grid. GFS, um, we can edit it. You can create user localization versions and look. Um, notice this location equals base. This is the default versions for all of these um, resource definitions and attributes. So we can edit. It'll bring up a editor dialog down at the bottom. Um, with the G file, this is the same um, grid stream that's available in UTD. Um, we can find these in the product browser, that hierarchical tree on the right side. Um, we can copy an existing grid to a new one. Rather than hit edit, we can select copy, and it will enable the resource name, resource type name. So a copy of resource name, we'll give it a unique name, save it, relaunch National Center's perspective, and it would show up in our In our menus. Um, further over, we've got our attribute groups and then our attribute files. And I want to quickly just show, cancel that, these attribute files. Um, take something like 1,500 millibar relative humidity and edit. What we see here is Genpack syntax. And this is very literally the uh, Genpack NTS file that has been copied over the old system as well as the old. Um, commits, 1997, David Plummer, he's still there at NSA. Um, if you are not familiar with Genpack, this is an example of the syntax. It is a 
primarily a command line program that you can uh, enter in the parameter, uh, or not the parameter, sorry, you can enter in the uh, variable equals value, essentially. So GEPFUN equals relative humidity. Um, what we see here is exclamation points used to uh, specify two fields. So essentially, relative humidity uh, with a color and, uh, sorry, relative humidity contoured and color filled, and relative humidity just contoured. So then there would be contour intervals for each of those, uh, line colors and line um, configuration definitions for each of those. It's not really the focus of this workshop on GEMPAC, but for those who do know GEMPAC, this should look familiar. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the create bundle and just select clear and load, and it should just clear everything out. And I wanna load a grid just to show you the differences between what we see in D2D and what we see here in the National Center's perspective. So selecting bundle, selecting add, selecting grid, let's say GFS, and MSL, boundary layer, temperature, and wind. Um, the cycles that are available will be shown in a small drop down. So 600, sure. Add resource. There is the timeline. And just go ahead and click load. Cross your fingers, it actually loads data. Not every attribute file that's available through this menu will load data. It's very possible that if you select something at random, it shows that the grid exists, that cycle exists, exists, and then you load the fields, it will just display nothing. Um, but I made sure that at least the global GFS was working this morning. Just want to give you guys a sense of the differences between how grids are displayed in D2D, what we saw is either images and, and the wireframe contours versus this gem pack display. Um, so this actually uses a gem pack library um, that has been pre-built and then bundled into uh, the cave client to render uh, the gem pack grids. And let's see if I can, oops, still loading 82 frames probably too much. So I'm going to pull this down. There we go. I want to get the data stack viewable over here. So similar to D2D, hold right click on the actual grid um, name. And what you'll notice is uh, we don't have any of the menu options for like imaging and um, line width and color and things like that. But there is a edit second from the top. That brings up a gem pack dialogue editor. So this is sort of another way to modify these bundles. And you can change this on the fly. You can change the colors of the lines and the thickness and whatnot. You click apply and it will update the rendering automatically. So again, this is pretty um, difficult to read. It's not really human readable form, but GDPFUN. So we've got temperature, 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 and then pressure mean sea level. So that's the fourth one over. And the lines, one, two, three, four, I think 19 is that color yellow for um, surface pressure being contoured. And I think if we just change that to one, it turns white. Yeah, okay. That gives you an example of just modifying Gempack esque code. Let's say like colors here and there. Yeah. What this what this does uh, what I like about this, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is the colorful contour aspects are uh, pretty easily controlled. It's not an image such as is rendered in D2D. Um, but a more complicated uh, rendering of these the wireframes and then filling them in based on the GEMPAC syntax. So. But also looking at the top right now, I think this thing runs on 
mine on this machine at 13 gigs already. So I'm not really sure. We don't even get this message, you know, and, and it has to be exploding. It goes through a few seconds and then just fixed. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. There's quite a few of those grids that are not going to load and they don't give any indication that they are available. Um, try loading the exact same that I've loaded, which is grid, GFS, basic weather, PMSL, DL template. At least try that and make sure it loads the same. Basic weather, PMSL, temperature, I mean, yes. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. And the same cycle? Uh, yep. Interesting. And average force, load, initializing, initializing as you create loading, and clear. <clears throat> clear. Try this again. I quit loading and so, so there's nothing going to happen. Yeah, it's at least loading. So. But yeah, I think I can reproduce what you're seeing where um, select just a random. And no, it's going to load. OK. I'm not sure. I mean, as you guys can see, there's quite a few problems with the National Defense perspective. Um, it's not very well liked within the NSEP, actually. Um, and there may be some major changes coming to it. So, um, yeah. So product generation plugin I mentioned before. Um, it's also been migrated over from Gempack uh, anyways. And the interface is um, still kind of hideous like it always was. It's a, a drawing tool that forecasters use to issue uh, products. And so essentially you have a dialog that pops up. You have a number of different um, functions, actions they're called, uh, classes. Is selected front, and then the objects for that class where we can draw a number of different types of fronts. So fronts, combo symbols, symbols, any track, circle, sigmet, text, marker, so on and so forth. Um, you can select any of these. Uh, we have an attribute dialog that we don't really need. Um, select, say, cold front, and left click once. And let the mouse up. Oh, it's hard to see, isn't it? I can change the color. Let's do that. Yellow. So click once, and we can start drawing. And you can just wherever I'm drawing it to, it's going to stretch out. Um, I can click again to give it another uh, vertex, and then from there it will um, curve around and allow you to draw sort of complex shapes. So you can go nuts with this, right? This is all just left clicks. And then to end the drawing of this shape is a right click anywhere on the map you want to, you want to end the drawing. Here we go. Symbols, plop some low pressure symbols. We can make these like wide and large, make them really ugly. I'm not doing anything in particular here, just showing. So that PGen tool also exists in D2D. Um, I'll switch back really quickly. And then up here at the top right is PGen. And it's the exact same dialog and the exact same functionality. Draw some lines. Right. Switch back into NCP, and we have the NChart plugin that's also available, uh, similar to D2D. Sticks to the right side. We can load 
and man, that's tough to see. Um, it's a little bit more. Uh, there's a couple more data types in full right? We have model soundings and archive files. Um, observe soundings uh, is the source of uh, UAR or the buffer UA OBS. Again, they're going to load up markers that are clickable on the map depending on the um, ray OB that's available. Clicking any of those markers is going to load an N sharp editor. Um, but yeah, similar to load that again. Similar to the observed soundings, we can take model soundings. So I might just have only GFS available right now. Um, selecting any of these, let's just say no sounding type. Yeah. So nothing available right now. So we don't have a lot of data. We have the GFS, so that should show up. Essentially, you're defining a lat lon um, coordinate or a station identifier in order to get a model sounding displayed in intro. So um, I apologize that the National Center's perspective is not working all that great. Um, there's a lot of bugs that still need to be tracked down and fixed. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I don't use the National Standards Perspective that much, and I don't teach much of it because it's um, not in good shape right now. Um, it seems to be a very big waste of my time to track down bugs that should be solved by NSEP by the developers. Um, I did want to cover it just so you guys are familiar with it, but I'm a little embarrassed that it doesn't work that well. So, any questions on that? NCP, Gempack, grid capabilities? It's my hope that in the future uh, we won't need the National Center's perspective at all. That similar to PGen being migrated over, the Gempack capabilities can be migrated over. And then we're in D2D and we have all the grids and other data available, but we can just plot Gempack type grids on top of that. Um, that's kind of my hope. and. Like I said, at NSEP, they are discussing plans to scrap the whole thing and start anew because they did not um, they did not start out with a good strategy. They did not extend the existing plugins. They copied them over and modified them, and their changes have not kept up with the baseline. Yes. Ask Scott Jacobs about this. He can't believe it either. <laughs> So um, part of the migration for Gempack is they um, wrote a data access framework. It's essentially a Python API for requesting data from index server. So all the data that we've been rendering in D2D has been uh, requested over an HTTP connection from the EDEX server. Um, it's HDF5 on the data server. It gets compressed and serialized and sent to the client and then rendered by the GPU here in Cave. All of those data that were requested through CAVE are also request, requestable through this Python API. Um, in operations, it's called UFPy, the UFrame, UFrame PY. Um, I've renamed it Python AWIPS and released it as, as its own package, supported by unit data. Uh, it's open source. Um, for NTEP, it allows folks to run Gempack like GD programs on the command line and NMAP programs and specify a remote EDX server and the data sources from that remote EDX server. It goes through the Python API to request those data and then it renders them back in Gempack. So for example, a couple of years ago um, when they switched to buffer, uh, buffer upper air ops, rather than writing a new decoder for Gempack, they just simply wrote, uh, they extended the Python data access framework in order to display the buffer UA in Gempack. So they are not developing new decoders for Gempack anymore. They are using the Python data access framework for that. Um, I've got a couple of 
Jupyter notebook examples that we should be able to just fire up Jupyter like we were uh, the last couple of days with the MetPy workshop and touch on its capabilities. So let's see. Did you all, um, most of you are using your own computers for the last two days with MetPy, but we do have Miniconda installed on all of these, I believe. It's not on all of them. It's on the last two rows and a couple others. Okay. Uh, okay. If you did use it on your computer, you definitely had them installed. Yeah. Yeah, it's installed on yours. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think you guys should be familiar with this from the last couple of days. Uh, I'm going to start a new shell, and I'm going to look at which Python. And OK, Miniconda 3 is sourced. And that should be in uh, batch RC, export path equals Miniconda 3. All right. And then in the unit data Python workshop directory, uh, I believe we've already created the environment. And so we can do source activate uh, Unidata workshop. Is that right? Okay. And from here, Jupyter Notebook. That's what you guys did? Okay. To say, there we go. All right, so it'll pop up uh, Jupyter, and we want to go into notebooks. Don't let me get ahead of you guys, but um, is this working? Is this okay? All right. In notebooks, uh, there is a directory called Python AWIPS right here um, that I would, I'm going to guess that you guys have not explored yet. Um, and within this, directory are a few notebooks that uh, have some examples of requesting um, AWIPS data and rendering it in Python using Cardipy, Matplotlib, um, and a few other packages, MetPy included. So I don't want to get too much into this, um, but I want to make you guys aware of these notebook examples and I'm going to run through this. So first notebook, AWIPS grids and Cardipy, or Cardipy. Um, And I'll walk through this pretty carefully here. So I believe you guys used um, Cardi B and Matplotlib to render uh, grids from a thread server um, or some other data source, something like that. These notebooks were modified from the NetPy example. And rather than uh, requesting from the thread server, we're importing the AWIPS um, data access framework. And then we're creating a request. And then we'll send that request and get data back and render. So Google Python AWIPS or go to Python AWIPS read the docs.io. There is a um, Documentation page with installation instructions and API documentation and then data plotting examples. And these data plotting examples uh, were created from the notebooks that were running in the other tab. Um, but this gives you, let's see. Bit of a reference for this package, but let's just walk through this pretty slowly. Um, we're importing a uh, data access layer from AWS.data access. And we're saying change edX host to edX desktop. And we can change this to edX test data instead of edX dash cloud. And so it's the same server that we've been connecting to OK. And then we're going to create a new request, data access layer dot new data request. Then we can set the data type, the location name, the parameters, and some buttons. These are kind of generic um, names that are applied across all different data types. Um, 
So set location names here is the actual model that you wrap 13 in this case, except for amateurs is going to be the uh, grid date, in this case temperature, two meters, so <laughs> There are a couple of functions for getting available times. And what I think would be a good idea here is to copy this out and add some new cells and walk through this pretty slowly. works and we can do cycles times forecast run and response so pretty much everything is taken care of right here but one at a time I mean we can say cycles we should be doing the IR break this up No route to host. Okay. Okay. So I'm not sure why EDEX Cloud is not resolving. Um, I'm a little worried about that. But it, let's change EDEX host to EDEX test. So it's the um, same server that we're using with Cave. And setting the request for wrap 13 temperature, two meters above a fixed height above ground. And then cycles. Um, it's going to print out every single cycle that is available for that model. So the RAP 13, it looks like it has five or six. Um, and the latest is going to be the 1900. All right. Um, times, so get available times with the request and a Boolean specifying true is going to return the available model cycle. If we do not specify that Boolean at the end of get available times, which is this next line down here, times equals versus cycles equals, it's going to return every single grid forecast time. It's not going to order them or bin them by um, cycle. It's just going to return them all. And so this next function, um, which is get forecast run, is going to take the last cycle available, the latest available, plus all of the times that are available, and it's going to give you uh, one Python object um, that is a complete cycle with all the forecast times of that cycle. So we can put some more print statements in here. Um, let's just like run this and add another block and start printing out what this looks like. So times is going to be everything, like I said, where cycles are just the um, times of the six available cycles. This is every grid for every cycle, right? And that's it. But the forecast run is going to be every um, time for that 1900 uh, cycle. And then response is going to be, there we go, one single object. So response is this get grid data. And it uh, is passing through the request that we made up here plus the um, forecast or the first element of forecast run. So forecast run and let's see what we have here. Okay. If we do a DIR and forecast run, it's going to show actually that's not right. Uh, I want to do this. Let's do That's what I want to look at. I want to look at an individual um, object within that forecast run array. Because notice that when I'm printing out just print grid, well, these all look the same. They're not showing the actual 
forecast hour. So the DIR for grid in order to interrogate the available methods. And you can see get reference time and get forecast time. So back up here, we should be able to say print grid dot ref time. Oh, that didn't help, did it? Uh, reference time is going to be 1900. Get forecast time. There we go. Okay. And so we can say get. get reference. Ooh. You guys are probably better Python programmers than I am, so bear with me. All right, so that's kind of a kludgy way to get an idea of what this time and focus time is up this hill. Before it goes out, or sorry, the rock goes out 22 hours or something, right? All right, so response essentially going to send to this get grid data we're going to send our request that we built up here um, plus we're going to say give me uh, this grid which are a python object of grid values uh, for that single time so the first um, initialization of the 1900 wrap 13. we should be able to say EIR response and get an idea of what's available here. Nope. Say. Okay, that's a little better. It's a bad way to do it. So, to give you an idea of the Functions that are available to call for each grid within our response. We've got get attribute, get attributes, get data time, get uh, law accordance, get level, location name, parameter, get raw data, and get data. And so in this next block, we have grid equals response. Just get the first one, right? Data equals get uh, equals grid dot get raw data. Lawns labs equals grid dot get lat lawn accordance. And so, yeah, let's print out a few things here and say, what does this grid look like? Nope, not grid, data. And lawns, labs, like so. The NumPy 2D array, the actual grid values, temperature and degrees caliber. And then further down, here's our lawns, and further down, here's our labs. And print out the shape of these. In the thought shape. All right, so data dot shape one seventy five, one seventy five. I think that's actually been clipped. So there's a little function here to make a map. Um, create figures and axes, set the extent of the bounding box. The bounding box is created just above based on the min max of the black long. There we go. Right? Coast lines, latitude formatter, longitude formatter, all right, and then plotting with peak color mesh. Probably not going to look like this. I think the I think the grid is going to flip to around Omaha on the test server. So I'll run this and see what it looks like. So it's a couple of plotting one with peak color mesh. Yep, it's been clipped. Okay. 
P color mesh and contour ref. And it's being clipped because you're on the end to the OAX localization. Yeah. So it's not giving you the entire. Yes. Yeah, there's a uh, default functionality on EDX server to um, subgrid or clip a lot of um, mesoscale grids to around the localization spot. So, um, yeah, that should definitely not be 175, 175. All right, so let's go back to the um, Jupyter notebook examples and let's look on that second one, grid levels and parameters. And it goes into a little bit more detail of what's available. Um, I'm going to make sure that we can actually connect to. Okay, looks like we're going to have to use EDX test for this example. There we go. So just make that one modification. So EDX dash cloud, EDX test. And then step through. Um, few of these cells and get an idea of what's available. So change edX host we saw in the last notebook. Um, get supported data types and then listing all the data types. So here we go. We we're only using the grid. We we're specifying that in our request back in the other notebook. There's quite a few data types that are available. Um, pretty much any data plugin that exists in edX is, is going to be exposing um, the data to the data access framework. So we can grab TOPO, we can grab warning polygons, surface ops, um, satellite and radar imagery. Um, anything that's in our maps database, we can call with this Python API and render. So this is kind of a simple example that says, okay, next step is selecting a data type. In this case, um, set data type to grid. And what are the available location names? And again, location names for grids means it's the grid name. So this is the exact same list that's available in the product browser back in Cave on the right side. Connecting to the same server. There you go. CMC, S -DOF S, ADA2, 18, ETSS, so on and so forth. Okay, and then we want to define a single grid, set location names, wrap 13, and then show what parameters are available through this API with a call to get available parameters with the same request. So step by step, we're modifying the request. We're making it more specific. We're saying grid type of, or the data type is grid, location name is wrap 13. Now show me what parameters are available. Here's everything that is exposed by this Python API. What this doesn't do yet is allow you to request derived parameters. So anything like those uh, wind and the vectors and helicity and things like that, if the, the parameter doesn't exist in the grid already, it's not exposed in the data access framework just yet. All right, and we set a parameter and we can see what levels are available for that parameter. In this case, there's quite a few levels for the RAP13 temperature. Um, a lot of isobaric levels. And set it to two meters above ground level. And then a little explanation of the get available times and the cycles and whatnot. So we're requesting a grid and then printing out um, specifics for that grid. So get the data time, lap on, raw data. Location names, parameter, get data from the shape. So, temperature of Kelvin, graph 13, 1900, And then it plots in with Matplotlib and CarP, just like the last notebook. Oh, reflectivity. Um, this is a bit of a complicated notebook because it use, I won't go into too much detail, but rather than pulling out the um, calculated values, pre-calculated values of like reflectivity and velocity, it actually pulls the raw level three HDFI file and does the calculation itself. But the result is we can have a cartopy map with reflectivity values plotted, um, converted to plan view from a radio 
uh, image. So an example of one kilometer base reflectivity and quarter kilometer base velocity uh, over Portland, Oregon. And then a little two pane um, zoom that um, I created just so I could go in manually and check the values, visually check the values in cave versus Python. Another notebook here for storm total um, accumulation. Again, it gets a little complicated. Um, but there's kind of an ugly storm total precipitation view of level three files. And satellite imagery is a pretty straightforward notebook. Um, again, we're setting data type and location names for satellite. The location names going to be the sector. Um, Further down, it's defining the um, product. So back in D2D cave, we can say, OK, satellite is the type. Location name is global, which I believe is under Where is this alignment? Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. Get this. So I think the source of, of these global images is the um, SSEC generation, uh, Mikaitis imagery. So it's decoded through the Mikaitis decoder rather than the satellite Gini decoder, and they're given the source name of GOES 13. Notice there's GOES 13N and there's GOES 13. So this is a Gini source, you know for it, and this is your Mikaitis area file source um, from SSEC. So in this case, it is the 11 micron IR, which is going to be global. Change the color. Now. All right, that's good. All right. And I change that over to like a Mercator projection. So that's what it looks like in Cave. And back in our Python notebook, we keep stepping through. So you find eight available times. Get our grid, we'll report the grid size, the grid extent, and then we can plot it and give it a proper color map. We should see the same product. Yep, slightly different color map, but you can see plotted in DGD cave versus Python. So none of the rendering here is AWIPS related. This is just a data retrieval um, Python package that is using existing packages like um, Cardi, MetPy. Uh, I don't have the upper air diagram uh, notebooks in this example, but they use MetPy and then there's uh, surface um, station plots as well. Uh, watch and warn warning polygons um, gets a little bit more Carry here, so I'm gonna change that to the X test again. <clears throat> and we're setting the data type to warning, and then we're setting parameters to prevent everything that is being stored in Postgres to these uh, warning data products. So 591 records. And go through this process of creating a dictionary of lists for each parameter. So 12,000 geometries. Print out some basic info. <coughs> Issue date time. New range geometry. Yeah, something went wrong. Let's try this again.
Hmm. Well, I'll show you guys what it should look like. So the idea here is to pull um, every existing um, watch and warning polygon, warning polygon, sorry, uh, plot on this map, and then overlay it on level three radar. Um, so it uses some of the um, radar retrieval uh, code from one of the other notebooks in California, a couple of polygons, tornado, flash flood warnings. Um, obviously, it, there's no storm there, so I think these are not um, the same times. But. Upper air buffer soundings. You know, I don't have a notebook for this, but it gives you an idea of using MetPy to request um, the buffer UA data and then plotting it with MetPy. And then just above that, another example of surface ops plotted with MetPy. Right? And observe soundings. So it's a little wonky down at the surface, but model sounding data. Yeah. <clears throat> so another example that I haven't added to the notebook collection of the documentation online is uh, the ability to plot all the map resources um, that we've been loading or we've been getting. Um, slightly different syntax here. We want to add multiple identifiers and these are really tied to the Postgres tables on the EDX server. Um, so there's a couple of steps here that are showing if you do have access to this Postgres um, database, you can make these PSQL commands and get an idea of like, what's available. So in this case, mapdata.county, and we show what columns are available in that Postgres table. Um, GID, state, CWA, county name, the geom is an actual shape of geometry. Post GIS record. Um, so yes, note the multiple note the multiple geometry definition for the geom field. Further back up, we're saying at identifier geom field is the underscore geom. Location field is the current watch area. Set location name to Boulder at identifier. So um, takes a few definitions to get this right, but the idea is. Uh, we are going to request resources, uh, <clears throat> request these map resources that exist only for the Boulder um, area of responsibility. So there's a block of setup here, importing Cartby, NumPy, Shapely, data access framework. We've got our map creation function up here, and then our change index host and our request. So we're saying the data type is maps. And identifier table is that map data dot county. Again, this is like you, you have to know what is involved in the Postgres table, um, and this is pretty um, new, and so the documentation is not complete. Um, essentially, what this example does is it grabs county boundaries and plots them um, for any county that's within the area of responsibility for the Boulder Forecast Office. It then creates a merged uh, geometry using cascaded union. So then we've got two of them plotted. We've got the merged outline plus the individual counties. We can then use the WFO boundary as a spatial filter to request things like cities, topography, and interstates, and anything else that we can load um, through CAVE. So it's the exact same interstate um, polygons that are loaded in CAVE, overlaid, load some nearby cities, fudge with the density a little bit, load topography. Um, you can see sort of how the um, sample grid, it's a 2D numpy array. So um, there's kind of the final product of grabbing all these uh, map resources, no data resources at all, but just modifying or uh, setting up a background map for whatever plot that we'd like. Yes? Where is this located again? Uh, this is the Unidata developers blog. Um, 
on our website. We can go to news and you need a developer's blog here. And it's under the AWIPS section over here, browse by topic. But it's also just a little bit further down, I guess the fourth item down on this page. Yeah, this will be a, a Jupyter Notebook added um, sometime soon. But again, the documentation is pretty poor for this, um, and that's on me, but there's a lot of information. There's a lot of database tables here um, and a lot of options. So uh, I'm figuring this out as I go and trying to document it as best I can. So, but it gives you an idea of what you can do with this. And there's a lot of data types, like going back to um, the grid levels and parameters and looking at all these available data types here, this get supported data types call, like I've not done anything with buffer moss lamp or buffer moss GFS or air rep or ACARS. Um, but yeah, there's, um, I mean, this is kind of poorly documented within the Ellipse community uh, weather service. But. Michael, is there a way to query the index servers and have it so you could get the full grid if you wanted to and not default to the OAX localization? Oh, yes, what yes. That, that is something that I modify before um, final release or version. Um, by default, they clip a lot of the, um, like mesoscale grids, like the her and the wrap, um, and I have to take those out. And I thought I did before this workshop, but apparently not. So, so we'll just wait for you to. Yeah. Um, on edX cloud, uh, there is no clipped grids. They are the full resolution. So that, is, that has everything to do with the server, nothing to do with our queries. Yes, that's right. All right, so I mentioned before that there is a um, user guide available on the uh, AOPS page at Unidata under software, and the first link is documentation. Um, ooh, that's not good resolution. So there are some installation instructions. There's a cave user manual, which covers a lot of what we did um, today. There's an edX user manual, which covers a lot of the system administration side, running ELDM. Um, ingesting new grids, um, data distribution files, um, these files that match regular expressions um, to, de to determine which decoder to use for which files, uh, purging, monitoring users, things like that. We didn't touch on edX and we're not doing any um, edX administration in this workshop. Um, some supportive data types and some examples of the bundles that are available in CAVE. Um, satellite imagery and information on the different products that are available, a few uh, appendix tables, list of the free and open source software that's available, um, AWIPS grid parameters, and WSR ADAD products. So um, there's a few ways to uh, submit trouble tickets or ask for support requests. Um, one of them is to go to the AWIPS2 GitHub page, which is linked to from um, the manual up top, GitHub. Go to repository. You can create an issue here. Um, however, I, we do prefer uh, do prefer that you use our support system and. So the fourth link over at the top of the unit data page is support. So we've got links to documentation, ah, documentation, training tutorials, mailing lists, and support archives. Suggested support process to submit a request. We can either do web-based or email-based. And we have uh, standard email addresses for all the packages. So if you send an email to support.awips at unidata.com.au, that will reach my inbox. Um, and then number of different support email addresses for all the different packages and projects that we're involved in. 
Um, there's also a request form linked to where you can submit, okay, software package and hardware information and attachments and things like that. Um, There is an AWIPS2 users mailing list. Uh, if we navigate to support and mailing list, the third option down, um, we'll have a expandable uh, mailing list action button right here that allows you to subscribe to it, either in digest or non-digest form, um, unsubscribe, or view the archive. So uh, we can view the archives by thread, and we can search them. And generally, if you're going to search a AWIPS uh, problem through Google, it's likely that uh, these support archives are indexed, and you'll hit one of them uh, and hopefully get an answer before you have to write in um, to us. But um, yeah, these are the options for support. Uh, email is strongly encouraged. So, How do you guys feel about this? I went through the data access framework pretty quickly, but I feel like you guys have a good handle on Python after the last two days. So did this stuff look familiar? <clears throat> Questions, things we can cover again, go into more detail. See if you can hit the SSE CDI server. Okay. I forget what the one you guys gave us permission to. Is it five or address? I'm trying to hold on. Maybe it's data four dot SSE C. I think so. Probably, I don't know if it'll have the OAX localization. I think that might have been part of the issue. Was yeah, it does have the OAX does information. It? It, it looks like it's not reaching that one. Uh, maybe you want to try it with data five. I think okay. five might have been the one. I, because I know the firewall only lets us through certain ones. I think you opened it up to our whole okay. subnet. Yeah, I, I didn't know if we did that for both of them. Five was the one I was trying to for. Okay. Here we go. Validates. Let's see. You guys have any uh, special products on the server? Right now, it's only going to be Gozar data. Okay. That's all you guys have on it? Yeah, well, it crashed a while back, so. Uh, <clears throat> there was a data mount that's on there that uh, was crashing. So it, I'm sure you guys have seen these pop-ups at the bottom. Um, occasionally, they'll turn red if they're an error. Otherwise, the warnings are um, black or gray. You can see these in alert view. Uh, in our client, it's in the cave menu, open alert view, and it pops out this window, which I like to draw down here. And you can see, yeah, so it looks like just some scale issues between your server and our client, some notification stuff, nothing critical, still ran. Um, so let's see what loads. Are. Is this the another feed off a of no port? Well, this is probably the raw stuff, right? This is the this is the no port goes on. It is the no port, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So mm -hmm. this is much farther than I went the last time I tried this, but it's been a while. You guys are running a 16 version of edX down there? 16, 2, 2, 2. No, they're all they're all 17, 1. Oh, they are. Okay. 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 Yeah, so that looks right. Yeah, that does. Oh, actually. Because we've got <laughs> Is that well, it's right, but we're getting weird data today. They're in a right. mode, maybe I'm on mode four and it's screwed up a lot. All right, yeah. 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 Well, problem solved, I guess. Is is do you guys host model or other data on any of your services at all? All Taylor's data four and Taylor's data five will eventually have the full complement right. um, once we get the issue resolved. Okay. But um, the intent, yeah, the intent is to have Taylor's data four and five be interchangeable. For the okay. Five. Yeah, so you, you guys can notice the difference in the scales that are available. These are determined by the um, server, um, right. but also modifiable by the client through localization. So yeah, we've got some some new features <clears throat> available. You guys aren't ingesting anything else in on no, the server. No, right? there's probably like one grid product in the, uh, in the um, We can just see it with the with the browser. The product, yeah. browser yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's just a map, so there's should be one unknown model. There you go. So if you load that. It should appear over uh, the comments. Still Fairly high resolution grid, mm -hmm. uh, five kilometer long columns. But that's the, the, the uh, goes our uh, well, the simulator. Not a simulator, it's just uh, the TPM stuff. Yeah, that's TPM. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, well, I'm glad to see if this works. Yeah, oh, you've got your own menu up here. I see that. That's the CC. Yeah, that's cool. On beers, ABHR. The, the, the original plan uh, back when we proposed this to Unidata was to have, you know, a shared EDX server here in the building. Right. And I think that in, in, in an EDX server that we can access from outside uh, for, for AOS community members here to access from outside the building is still in the works. It's just been difficult to get the sysadmin to keep this thing up and running because. Yeah. Crash is hard. It's not a matter of just restarting the service. It's a matter of rebuilding the entire yeah. data store and meta database and all yeah. that other stuff. Are you guys taking the um, Collaborate 2 RPM release? Or? Yes, okay. that is the way we do it. We, we okay. could, we have the ability to build our own version, but we traditionally not done that. Yeah, it's still requesting data it's within the building, right? It is in the building, but we say it was a five kilometer data set. Five kilometer grid. I mean, from our machines, it takes maybe a few extra seconds. Obviously, huh. this is uh, not too long, but mm -hmm. uh, not sure what the path between SSEC and AOS is. I would hope it's not through some node somewhere else in the city. No, it should be. It should be all on campus. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It bounces to Maryland and comes back. <laughs> <laughs> well, knowing that the connection works, I can play around with it. That's like I said. Yeah, I mean, and, and we can. I, I don't really see for testing purposes at least why we can't give you access to Azure State of Four. Mm -hmm. I think if it goes broader use to the students, I, I'm still not exactly sure how we can. Control it enough so that the students don't get in there and start messing with our localizations. Right. Yeah, localization is really tricky because by default, um, any user I think could go in and create a user localization version of like purge rules, um, which I guess will supersede the base because there is no there is no like user version of data. There's only user versions of data purge rules. So. You wouldn't want, if you're re retaining data for like a month, you don't want a user to go in there and change that to a day and wipe out your data archive. Um, 
So I've locked down a lot of that stuff from the unit data release. Um, user roles, right? Um, right. Okay. Control that, um, but you have to be very you have to be very specific um, on every little thing to, to make sure it's tied down. So it, it, we can go see what you have available. What's that? We can go see what you have available. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Charlie, I think the the config might be in the client though, because this looks the same. So I'm not seeing anything for EDX. I, I don't think we have yeah. EDX uh, configs available historically on. Okay. Yeah, I didn't even mention the MRMS um, multi sensor, uh, multi reader, multiple sensor. Um, I don't have those data feeds enabled by default, but if you run your own EDEX, it's pretty uh, easy. It's just another LDM pattern action, and there's quite a few different. Uh, grids that are available here. So uh, tracks, lightning, precipitation, reflectivity products, velocity products. Look at those. Those are pretty high res grids. <coughs> yeah, I'm surprised this hasn't loaded yet. No, I don't know what to do. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. That might have been the uh, derived parameter for CAPE. Hanging there for some reason, but yeah, pretty sure. Hmm. Yeah, so that's it. Okay, thanks. As I said, under normal conditions, we have the full suite of things that we have available. Okay. What are these artifacts down here? These spots? Yeah, I wonder if that's the GOZAR data today because we, it's all messed up. Huh. It never used to look like that. So <clears throat> either that's my fault creating the grid 2 file where it's GOZAR since I never did anything wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, GOZAR has been kind of weak today. Well, that's what I've got for today. So if there's any other questions or anything I can go over, go over again. All right. Thank you. How many folks are showing up tomorrow? How many? Pack day. I'll be here. Cool. Well, my. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Did you want to see if you're getting the NLDM stuff from us? Sure, yeah. Let's see. Lightning, Striker 2, that was helpful. No, Striker 2, Striker. Oh, nice.